Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Faron. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as we play through the first two out of five overall rounds. Now, I would like to mention that the only reason this video is being made is because it was selected by the contributing producer level supporters of this channel over at the Patreon campaign. Now, you can learn more about how that works by going to patreon.com slash Games, and I do hope that you would consider directly supporting the channel in that way to help make future videos just like this one. Now, I'd also like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Before we start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. In the middle of the table, we have the main board, and it is made up out of five individual sections that are randomly shuffled up and then placed out into a different order each time you play. In the middle, there is this spinning disc, and on a player's turn, they are going to select one of these five sections to perform the associated action. In order to do that action, you have to pay a resource of the indicated cost on this spinning disc, and every round, this is going to rotate one-fifth. So the cost to do an action is going to change from round to round, and you can plan ahead for future rounds to know what costs you'll have to access the associated actions. Each action also costs resources to perform, and if the color of the resource needed matches the color of the resource you spent to gain access to that area, then you can use that paid resource as part of your main action cost. Once a player has completed an action, play will move on to the next one, and each of these actions will do different things for us. Up here, we can acquire noble cards that will give us ongoing or one-shot abilities in the game, and also give us ways to score points at the end. Next up, this area will give us access to artisan cards, which will give us endgame victory points as well as resources that we can spend on future turns. After that, this Nile area lets you spend associated resources to go up each of these tracks, which will give you endgame points, and also potentially give you resources. After that, down here, you can spend a decent number of resources in order to increase the scoring that you will get with your Burial Chamber token. Lastly, you can come over here to make an offering to the gods, and these tokens will give you a variety of benefits from just spending them as resources to also gaining wild resources for specific action areas around the board. Now, once we have gone through five overall rounds, which is tracked right over here, we will then do endgame scoring. As you can see, each of these sections has a pillar dividing it, and there is a condition listed on either side. Now, if you have met both of these conditions, you will score both, and if you only meet one, then you don't score any. That means every time you play the game, the random way in which these sections will meet will create customized scoring conditions that will be different each time you play. With all of that in mind, I think it's now time to start playing the game, and as you can see, the red player has the starting player token. Now, we are going to be playing as the red player today, so that means we get to take the first turn of the game, and on a player's turn, we can either take one action out on the board, or we can pass and not take any more actions for the rest of the round. Now, we are obviously going to take an action with our first turn, and I think we should visit the artisan area. Now, whenever a player performs an action on the board, they have to first pay the associated cost with that area. As you can see, this cost is the yellow resource, and we have to pay that cost to an empty spot that is next to the area we'd like to activate. As you can see, there are four spots, but this fourth one says four plus. Now, this game plays up to five players, and you only have access to this in a four or five player game. That means in this three player game, this is not actually available, and there are only three spots to activate this area. With that in mind, let's now go ahead and pay one yellow resource, and as you can see, we start the game with two of them. We also have a red resource and two silver resources, and these are special because you can spend these as any of the five main colors, so they are wild. Now let's go ahead and spend this yellow resource, and we can place it right over here, and we have now gained access to the artisan area. Next up, in order to perform the artisan area action, we have to spend three resources that are identical. That can be three black, three green, three red, three yellow, or three blue. Now, we've already paid one yellow resource to gain access to this area, and we are able to use that to move forward into the cost of this payment. That means we could spend three black, or we could spend two more yellow, because we have already invested one yellow into this overall action. Now, we are definitely incentivized to do that, because that is more efficient. Spending three resources instead of four is obviously a better plan. When we look back to our supply, we have a yellow, a red, and two silver left. So we could spend this yellow right over here, as well as a silver, which is wild. 
Now that is one option, but we actually have a different option available to us. During setup, we all drew two random noble cards and kept one of them, and this is the one we decided to keep. As you can see, it has an infinity symbol down here, which means this is an ongoing effect that we will have for the entire game, and that says we can spend a red resource as a yellow resource, or a yellow resource as a red, for the entire game. Well, we do indeed have a red resource in our hand, so we can use our noble card to make this effectively act like it's yellow, and now we have three identical resources, which means we have officially paid for this action. That means we can now take this action, and the way it works is we simply take any of the four face-up artisan cards on the board, or we can take the top random card from this deck. Now, I think this is a great card for us. As you can see, it shows a 2 with a victory point symbol, which means this is worth 2 points to us once the game is over. Now, obviously, if we had chosen this one, that is worth 3 more points at 5, and that would give us 2 wild resources, but this is going to give us 4 resources total, and I think that's going to be more important. So, we can now take these resources as a reward, and thematically, each of these resources is a different type of influence. The yellow are royalty influence, green is agriculture, after that, blue is trade influence, and the red is construction influence. We didn't get any black with this card, but it's worth noting that this is thematically justice influence. So we can add all of these back into our personal influence supply, and that has finished up our turn. Before the next turn, we do have to clean up the artisan area. First of all, any influence that was spent for the action needs to be sent back to the supply, but note you do not clear off any influence spent to gain access to the action over here on the wheel. We also have to make sure that there are always four face-up cards in the artisan area, so this one is seven points at the end of the game, but obviously only gives a single silver influence as an immediate bonus. With our turn complete, play is now going to move clockwise to the green player, and now they can take an action. After considering their options, they have decided to go to the offering area. That means they have to start by spending a green resource, and now they can perform the offering. The cost to do this is right up here. That says they have to spend one resource of any type, and obviously they have already spent a resource of any type to gain access to this area, so this effectively pays for the main action cost. Now what they get to do is they can take any matching pair of these offering tiles, and in addition to those, they can spend another resource of the same type as this in order to take another offering tile from the bonus area. After considering their options, they have decided to take this pair of offerings, and they are going to optionally spend another green, although in this case they are spending a wild, which is the silver influence. So that lets them take any of these four in the middle, and they've decided to grab this one here. Next up, their paid resources can be put back in the supply, and then green can add these offerings down into their area. Now this one right here can be spent as if it was a red resource, this one can be spent as if it was a wild resource specifically for the burial chamber action, and this one over here is just worth an extra two points at the end of the game. It's worth noting, once the game is over, every single offering token you still have in front of you, and every single resource you have in front of you, including silver, is all worth one point. So this is effectively worth three points, since it's one for the token, plus the two points that are printed on it. At this point, the green player's turn is done, and we don't reset anything in the offering area. This will have new offerings placed down into it at the end of each round. So, blue can now take their turn, and they have decided to visit the Nile. The first thing they have to do is pay one black resource to the central wheel, and now they can pay any of these sets of two resources to perform the associated action in the Nile area. Before they do that, it is worth noting that their special noble also has an ongoing effect, and this one pertains only to the Nile area. This says they can spend any resource to gain access to this area. It does not actually matter what this color is. So technically, they could have spent this yellow utilizing their noble, but they didn't mind spending the black on this turn. So they have to spend more resources, and if they go with this or that, you'll notice each of those has a single black resource as a cost. Now that does make sense, considering they've already spent a black resource, so that will pay for half of these, and they do have a yellow resource in front of them, so they are going to spend this over here, along with the black to activate the area, to perform these actions down here. The first thing to note is this shows a blue circle and a red circle. Now whenever there is a circle, you immediately gain that resource from the supply, so they will get a red and a blue, and you'll notice whenever there is a square for a resource, that means you have to spend that associated resource. 
Next up, you'll notice this action shows two arrows, each of which has yellow and black within it. Now, each of these arrows lets them move their token up one of these tracks that matches the color, and you'll notice that the color in the arrows always matches up with the color resources that you spend to gain access. So that means they could go up on the black track twice, or the yellow track twice, or they could go up once on yellow and once on black. Now it looks like that is what they want to do. So they will go once on yellow and once on black. And these tracks are used for end game victory points. If the game is over and your token is in the middle, then that is worth three points. And if the game ends with your token at the top, it is worth seven points. And there is no bonus or penalty for moving up sooner or later on this track compared to your opponents. Before we move on, I would like to point out that this bonus lets you move up any of these tracks of your choice once, and this bonus over here, which shows a jar, means you draw the top jar from this stack, and you take the three resources that are printed on it. Well, Blue is done with their turn, so this resource can be discarded, which means it's once again time for us to go. Now, I think we should go to the nobles area of the board, and as you can see, that is going to cost one blue resource in this round. So we can place that right over there, and we have now gained access to this action. And in order to perform this action, we have to spend one of each of the five different types of resources. Now, obviously, we have already spent the blue with our cost to enter this area, so we now need to spend a red, a black, a green, and a yellow. Currently, we have all of those except for black, so let's spend one of our silver alongside the yellow, green, and red to finish this payment. That means we still have one silver left in our supply. Now that we have completed our payment, we can perform the action. The way this works is we simply take any of the three face-up nobles from the board, or we can take the top random noble from the deck. Now, this one right over here does not have an in-game function, but up top it does have an end-game scoring condition. It says it's worth three points at the end of the game, plus three more points for every noble card that you have, including this one. So, if this is the only noble you have, it's worth six points. We of course started the game with a noble, so if we took that, it would already be worth 9 points to us at the end of the game, and we would get 3 more points for every other noble that we take before the game is over. Now that is certainly a compelling choice for us. That being said, having in-game effects is also nice. This one right over here has a gear on it, and that means once per round you can use this by rotating it in order to perform the effect down at the bottom. This one right here says once per round, you can perform the burial chamber action, even if there are no spaces left on the board because all of those actions have been taken. This does not pay for that action, but it lets you squeeze in even if there are no openings. Now up here, this is worth six points at the end of the game, plus two points for every step of the burial chamber construction that you have done. Currently, we haven't done any, so this is worth six points to us. And finally, there is this one, which offers no endgame points, but it does have a lightning bolt symbol here, which means this is an immediate effect. Now, I think this is actually the one that we want to do, so let's take it and then describe what is on there. Now, first of all, this says we can do an artisan action, which means we can take any of the face-up artisans or take a face-down one. And I think I like the idea of taking this one, which is worth 7 points to us at the end of the game, and also comes with a wild silver resource. The other effect of the noble card we took says we can take a bonus offering from the offering area. Now that means we can take any from in here, or we could take from the bag, and it's worth noting, when you pay this extra cost, you can also take from the bag instead of from this area. And these do seem nice, but I think let's go random from the bag. We might end up bumping into one of those plus two prestige offerings, which would certainly be nice. And we have found this one. Now that is going to be worth any resource of our choice whenever we are paying for the entry cost or the action cost of the nobles area. As we've seen, the noble action is pretty expensive, so I am happy to have this so that we can hopefully pick up another one of these soon. Uh, perhaps this one right here, considering it is worth more and more points with each noble card that we take. Well, that has finished up our action, and we always have to have three face-up nobles over here, so we can draw the top one, and that is worth 10 points no matter what at the end of the game, and down here, this lets you pay any color resource to gain access to the burial chamber action area. We also have to refill the artisan area, so we can draw this card, and that's worth two points, plus a wild silver, and you can draw a random jar, and then take all three resources that are listed on it. With our turn done, it's now time for green to go and they have decided to visit the burial chamber area. They have to start off by paying a red resource, and they do have this red offering tile. They can actually put this right down over here to pay for it. Now they can do this action, and as you can see, this is actually a path that starts over here with this cube. Now whenever you perform this action, you are going to move your cube one space forward, and you do have to pay all of the associated resources with that next step. 
Now, as you can see, the first step costs a red and a yellow. They can pay for the red with their entry cost, and then for the yellow resource, they are actually going to pay this offering. Now, this shows the burial chamber area, and that means this can be used as if it was a wild resource, either for gaining entry into the burial chamber area or for paying the cost of the action. So this acts as a yellow and that red is paid for, so that means they can now perform the action, which means they'll simply move this cube up to the next spot, and now this is worth 5 points to them at the end of the game. As you can see, the farther up you go, the more victory points you get for each step. In addition to that, there is a special pharaoh icon over here that is associated with the third step of the chamber. Now that has to do with this pharaoh token, and on the back, this says, once you reach that spot in the burial chamber, and you have at least two nobles in front of you, you will then take this token, and it's worth seven points to you at the end of the game. Now this is a race, the first player to do this will take this token, and then no one else will get it for the rest of the game, so it's possible that is what Green's plan is. Well, Green's turn is done, so now Blue can go, and they've decided to visit the Nile again. Normally this would cost them a black resource to enter, but remember Blue has this Noble, which lets them for the rest of the game spend any resource of their choice to pay this entry fee. They have decided to go with a red, and with this interaction, that token counts as red, not as black, for the purposes of a discount on the main action. Now they are going to spend this blue resource that they have, and that way they've paid for this section, because of course the red pays for that cost, and this is going to give them a yellow resource, as well as a green resource, and then two bumps on the track that can be red or blue. Now they could go up twice on either of these, but just like before, they've decided to spread this out. So far, they haven't generated any points with any of these tokens just yet, but they are planning to do this action many more times in the game. Well, that's finished up their turn, which means it's now time for us to go, and currently we don't have that many resources. So I think instead of taking an action, let's pass. The way this works is we can look over here to the pyramid board and find the large token that matches our color. Then we are going to place that into the leftmost spot on the lowest row that does not have any tokens in it. Obviously that is the bottom row, so we'll place it right over here, and the first player to do this within each round will then take the starting player token. Since we did that first, that means we are going to be the starting player in the next round of the game. The other part of a passing action involves us choosing one of the face-up jar tokens to then take all of the associated resources. Now we know that in the next round of the game, this central wheel is going to rotate, in this game, it always rotates clockwise, but it's possible that it could rotate counterclockwise throughout the entire game. Considering it's going to go clockwise, we know that the noble action is going to be associated with the green entry cost, so I think it makes sense to try and get green resources. Now, I don't think we need two green resources. In fact, having a variety of different resources to pay for this is probably better, so let's take this jar here. That will give us one green, which will give us access into the area. That will also give us a yellow and a blue, which will help us to pay for another noble action, which I'm just assuming we're going to want to do in the next round of the game. Next up, this will be discarded, and a new one is not brought out, so the earlier in the round you pass, the more options you'll have for taking new resources. That has finished our passing turn, but before we move on, I'd like to talk about this triangle in more detail. As you can see, we are on a row with arrows, and now for the rest of the round, whenever it is our turn, instead of taking an action, we will then move this pawn over once to the right and then take the associated benefit. That means if both of our opponents pass right now, we will never actually push this forward, because once all players have passed, the round will immediately end. That means instead, our opponents now have to decide if it makes sense for them to pass or take another action, because if they take another action, that means we are guaranteed to get the next bonus. If this continues to happen, the bonuses get better. This is one of any resource, this is a wild resource, and then these would let us take more bonus offering tiles. So our opponents are certainly incentivized to not let the round drag on too long, and there is also an extra incentivization to pass early so that you can gain multiple of these bonuses every time it comes back around to you. With our turn done, green can go, and they have decided they would also like to pass. This means they are going to go to the next open row, which is right up here on the pyramid, and then they are going to take this jar. That's going to give them a red, a black, as well as a yellow resource. Now, before green finalizes their turn, they would now like to use their noble. That has a gear on it, which means this can be used once per round, and that says they can turn any of the resources into a silver. In this case, they have decided to get rid of this black to then take a silver, which is, of course, wild. 
With their turn done, blue can go. And instead of passing, they would like to once again use this ability. That lets them place any color down into the Nile area, and they will put a green resource down. And then they will also spend a yellow over here. The green is paid, and that is going to let them go up on the green or the yellow track. It looks like they want to spread things out, so they're going to go up on the green track, which means the next time they go up any track, they will then be in the victory point section. After that, they can draw the top jar tile from the stack and then take all of the associated resources. In this case, that is going to be two black resources as well as a yellow. All right, blue is done, so that means we get to go, and we have already passed, which means all we do on our turn is we move this token forward. Now we get that bonus, which says we can take one of any resource type. And when I consider we have a green, a yellow, and a blue, I think we should take a red or a black. And I think let's go with a red resource. That's finished up a quick turn for us, so now green can go. And they have also passed, which means just like us, they are going to gain a resource of their choice. Currently, this is what they have, and they've decided to go with another blue. With green's turn done, blue can now go, and they have decided to pass instead of spending these resources. They can tell if they took an action, then both of their opponents would move once more down this track, which would give each of us a wild resource, and they do not like the idea of that. Now, when they pass, they are going to be the final player to pass, which means they don't send their disc up here. Instead, they slide their disc over, and now the round immediately comes to an end. Before we do any reset, the blue player is going to take the final remaining jar, and that is going to give them two green resources and a blue. They can add those to their supply. And now it's time to reset for the next round. The first thing that we have to do is take all of the resources currently on the entry wheel and put them back into the supply. In this case, that's an offering, so we can send that over to the offering discard pile. And if we ever run out of offerings in this bag to place out, then we'll just shuffle these up and put them back into the bag. Speaking of offerings, we now need to refill this area. We aren't going to remove any of the tokens that are currently down here, but we have to make sure there are matching pairs of offerings equal to the number of players plus one. This is a three-player game, so we need four of those. So we can reach into the bag and pull two random tiles out to go over there. And then we also have to make sure that the bonus space has a number of tiles in it equal to the number of players plus one. So we have to take another one out of the bag and place that right in there. After that, it's now time to spin the wheel. As I mentioned before, this is going to go in a direction dictated by this tile, and during setup, we randomly decided which one it would be, and it will stay that way for the rest of the game. In this game, we are going clockwise, so we can spin this one step forward. Next up, we can focus on the pyramid, where we have to take all of the tokens from the rows and bring them back down to the round track, along with the other token that never left that track. This shows that we are all in the second round of the game, and now we have to reveal a number of jars equal to the player count, and of course, these will be the jars that we choose from when we each pass during the second round of the game. It's worth noting that when you set up for the fifth and final round of the game, you do not reveal any of these jar tiles, which means when you pass in the final round, you don't take any extra resources. The final thing we all have to do for setup is look down and reset any of our nobles that have this gear icon, which means they can be used once per round, which means they are all ready to be used in the next round of the game. Round setup is done, which means we are now ready for the second round of the game, and I am going to play through one more round before I discuss how endgame scoring works. If you'd like to jump to that right now, then feel free to go to the timestamp in the top corner, or you can stick around as we play through one more round of the game. Well, we are the starting player, so we can now take our first turn, and we do have everything that we would need in order to pay for another noble card. These are certainly very powerful ways to get a lot of points, but I'm worried this might be the only thing that we would do in this entire round of the game. If we did that, we'd have to spend all of these resources, leaving us with two wild tokens left, and I suppose we could do some things with those wild tokens, but I'm not sure if this should be our plan for the round. I would really like this card up here, obviously, but that does not give us any in-game benefits, and spending essentially an entire round to do that doesn't sound great when maybe we could do some other things to increase our productivity before we circle back to try and take this either in this round or later on in the game. Instead, I think let's head over here to the offering area. The entry cost is going to be a red resource, and that gives us access to any of these pairs. Now, I do think we want to take a bonus, and we have to pay for this before we actually take any of these tokens. So that means we have to spend another red. 
Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have any more red. However, we of course do have this noble, which lets us spend yellow as if it was red. So let's spend this yellow, and I do suppose we have a couple of the wild silver we could spend, but we want to hold on to those until we really need them. So we will spend this right over here. This acts as a red, so we have effectively a pair. And now let's take these two offerings. That's a blue and then another wild resource for taking a noble card. Then we can take one of these bonuses because we did pay for that. And let's go ahead and take this one because it is worth a bonus two more points at the end of the game. With our action done, we can now discard this. And then, of course, add all of these offerings down into our area. And it looks like we still have everything that we need to do a noble action this round if we want to. I suppose in order to do that, we would have to spend a silver. And we can decide if that makes sense on our next turn. All right, green can now go. And they have decided to head to the Nile. They will spend a yellow resource to gain access, and then this black resource to activate this area because the yellow is paid for from that token. This is going to give them a blue and a red, and then they can go up on the black or yellow tracks twice. After considering these options, green decides to go up the black track twice. So that token is now worth a minimum of three points to them at the end of the game. If they get it up to here, then it will be worth seven points instead. That's finished up the green player's turn which means blue can go, and they've decided to spend a yellow and a green in order to also visit the Nile. They can place the yellow there, and the green will help pay for this. That will give them a bump on the green or yellow tracks, and they've decided to go with the yellow track. Now they can take the top random jar and get all of the associated resources. That is going to be green, red, as well as blue. That's finished up their turn, which means we can once again go. Now, as I've been talking about, we could afford to spend five of our resources to take a noble action. Both of these would be wild. We have a green and a blue, so we would also have to spend another wild token, which would leave us with this after that. Instead, we could maybe do some other actions right now, like going up here to the artisan spot. I think this is actually a good idea for us, because we can spend a blue along with this blue offering tile, and then a silver in order to have our three of a kind. Then we can take one of these, and this is pretty good for us. That will be worth three points at the end of the game. Also, it will give us a blue, which is one of the ones we spent, and a red, and that's going to help us out with potentially doing the noble action later on. This also gives us a wild, which could certainly help things out, especially considering we just spent two blues and a wild to take a blue, a red, and a wild, and three points. So we effectively turned a blue into a red and got three points with this action. That's finished up our turn. And of course, we do have to draw a new artisan card. This means green is up, and they want to spend all three of their blue resources to also activate the artisan area. The blue will go here, along with these two over there, so they have their three of a kind, and they are going to take this one right over there. That lets them take all of the resources from a random jar, and in this case, that's going to give them two blue and a yellow. So they can add all of this down into their supply and then finish their turn by drawing a new card as well as clearing off these resources. Well, it's now the blue player's turn and they are going to use their noble once again to play any color tile down here to gain access to the Nile. In this case, they are going to spend a black and then they will also spend a red. That means they will activate this area. So that turns the black and red effectively into two silver, which are wild and they also get to go up once on the black or red track. In this case, they are going to go up the black track, and that's finished their turn. When we focus on the access area, you'll notice that all three of the spots are filled in, which means that the Nile action cannot be taken anymore in this round. All right, it's time for us to go again, and I think let's now go ahead and do the noble action. This is going to cost a green, which we could use this for, or we could use this token for, because it is wild for the purposes of gaining access or paying for the action. I figure we'll just put the green down, and then we have the blue, the red, the green, and then this will take care of our black and yellow costs. Now we can take any of these, and even though this doesn't give us an in-game benefit, I think this is potentially worth way too many points for us to just skip on. So that is worth three plus three points for every noble card that we have at the end of the game. And we currently have three cards total. That means this is worth 12 points at the moment, and we are certainly even more incentivized to take more of these noble cards before the game ends. Now, it is worth reminding you that we could have taken a random card from the top instead of this one here, but I felt like that one was going to be too lucrative for us. 
Our turn is now done, so we can clear off all of these tokens, and then we have to draw a new noble card. That's going to be this one. That's worth seven points at the end of the game, plus four points if you have the pharaoh marker, as well as four points if you end the game with the starting player marker. Now down here, it has an ongoing effect that says every time you pass, you start by putting your token one step farther to the right on the pyramid of time, which means you would place over here instead of over there, and you would immediately get the benefit. That does seem like a pretty great noble card. Maybe we should have gotten random off the top anyway, but perhaps we can circle back and take this one later on in the game. All right, it's now the green player's turn, and they want to spend two red resources in order to visit the offering area. This red will go over here, and the other red will give them access to the optional bonus token. Now they can take any of these sets, and they've decided that resources are probably slightly better than extra points at this moment, so they're going to take these two. This is a wild resource for the purpose of taking another offering action later in the game. Next up, they can take one of these bonuses because they did pay for it, and they will take this one, which is wild for doing more burial chamber actions. Well, that's finished up their turn which means it's now the blue player's turn. They've decided to do the final spot available in the artisan area. That's going to cost a blue, and then they'll spend another blue and a silver to match up as a wild, and now they can take any of these options. After considering them, they want that card, even though it's worth the least amount of points, because that is going to give them a silver resource, as well as three random ones from a jar. So they can draw the top jar, and that will give them a black, a blue, and a red. They can add those to their area and then reset the artisan area to finish out their turn. This means we are up, and I think at this point we should pass. So we'll move our token up here, and we are going to once again be the starting player in the next round. After that, we can take one of these jars, and two of them have doubles. This is two red and two yellow, and we can tell in the next round the red axis is going to be here, and yellow axis is going to be down there in the burial chamber area. Now, I think that yellow might make sense. It is a good idea to work on this at some point. And we can see the first step costs yellow, so that would match up with the access cost. And then we need red. Now, I guess we wouldn't actually need two yellow, so let's instead grab this one, which will give us a red and a yellow, as well as a blue. So we can take those from the supply. And now it's time for the green player to go. It looks like they would like to visit the burial chamber. That's going to cost a black resource, but they don't have any, so they're going to use this instead, which is a wild, for the purposes of gaining access to or paying for a burial action. They can place that right over there, and the next step for them costs a blue and a green. They do have a blue, but they don't have a green, so they're going to spend their wild to pay for this. That's finished their action where it seems like they just made five points, but they are investing in getting their token farther down because the later jumps are worth a lot more points for the number of resources that you spend. Their turn is done, so now blue can go, and they've decided to visit the noble area. That is going to cost them a green resource, and then when they do this action, they have to spend one of each. Obviously, the green is paid for, and then they have to spend a wild to cover their yellow. Now they can take any of these or a random noble, and while this one is tempting, they have decided to go for this one. That says, for the rest of the game, they can spend any resource of their choice to gain access to the burial chamber area. They haven't gone up on that track yet, but this will certainly let them leverage their resource costs to get better discounts on those bumps. They have already used this noble to great effect, and they now have two nobles with that type for two out of the five action areas on the board. This is also worth 10 points at the end of the game, no matter what they do. That's finished their turn, so now we can draw another noble. This one is worth 12 points, and it offers the same effect as the one taken, but this time for the offering area. Blue's turn is done, so now we can go, and we have passed. That means we can move our token forward and take one resource of our choice. Currently, we have a yellow, a blue, and a red, so I think let's take a green to increase our options in the next round. Well, it's now the green player's turn, and they've decided to use their noble ability to turn any resource into a wild. They can place this right over there, and now they would like to do another burial chamber action, this time using both of their wild tokens. The first of these will give them access. This wild token is now effectively black, and then the other one will cover for the red that they need, because this wild token as black covers for that cost. So they can move this token up, and they've just gained six points at the end of the game, and you'll note that as soon as they have two of these noble cards, they will then have everything they need to take this seven-point pharaoh. Obviously, they have just one noble card right now, but this is definitely going to incentivize them taking another one soon. 
Now, the last two actions did seem rather costly for green, especially considering this action did not have a discount. But they can tell in the next round, yellow is going to be over here, and they could use that as a discount to move onto that spot. And in the round after that, blue would hypothetically be over here, which would discount them over there as well. So they've set themselves up to potentially have a discount going forward through the next few rounds. Of course, there are only three rounds left to the game and four more steps, so if they want to get all the way to the end, they will have to do a double action again at some point before the game is over. Well, green is done with their turn, so now blue can go, and despite the fact that they have a whole bunch of wild tiles over here, they've decided to pass. That means they can put their token right up here, and then they can choose one of these two jars. When they look at their options, they think having another green is a good idea, so they will take this one, which is going to give them two yellow as well as that green. Blue's turn is done, so now we can go, and we have passed, so obviously we will move forward again. This time, we are going to get a wild resource, and that's finished our turn. Our turn is over, so now green can go, and they have decided to pass. This means they will get the remaining jar tile, which gives them two red and a blue resource. They will also move their token over here, and that immediately ends the round, and we can go ahead and pull all of these tokens back onto the third round spot of the track. With the round over, we can now reset for the next round. As you can see, a lot more actions happen in the second round of the game compared to the first. So we can take all of these tokens and clear them off. And then the next thing that we have to do is make sure there are four sets of these offering tiles over here. So we can draw this set of two out, as well as that set of two. And we have to make sure there is a number of bonus tiles equal to the number of sets. So we have to add two more to the bonus area. Next up, we can rotate the access wheel then draw three new jars, and finally reset all of the once per round nobles. All right, everything is ready for the third round of the game, but I think at this point I'm now going to stop playing. Instead, let's now discuss what happens once we have completed all four rounds of the game. Once that happens, we will not have to reset anything, and we can immediately jump into endgame scoring. In order to help facilitate this, the game comes with a nice score pad, and the very first thing that we are going to score are these pillar objectives. Now, I haven't talked about these in great detail just yet, and as you can see, there is one of these between each of the action areas on the board. Now, on the left and right side, there are scoring conditions. One of them is printed on the board with that column, and the other one is printed on the other board that was randomly placed next to it. Now, once the game is over, everyone is going to score each one of these five columns, and you will only get points if you have matched both of the criteria on either side of the column. This one over here says have two of the noble cards to get three points, and over here it says have two artisan cards to get three points. Once again, if you do just one of these instead of the other, you get nothing. So effectively, this says have two noble cards and two artisan cards to gain six points. For another example, we can see this pillar says have three artisan cards and three of your tokens on at least the first step of a Nile track in order to gain eight points. Now it's worth noting that these cannot be used at the same time. That means if you want to score this pillar and this pillar, you have to have two plus three or five artisan cards because once again, the two you use for this scoring cannot be used for this scoring over here. When we look down here, we can see the other two conditions involve having a certain number of offering tiles left over at the end of the game. And the last one is associated with a certain number of movements along the burial chamber track. With this in mind, when we glance back up here, you can now see one of the reasons why we have been pushing so hard on getting nobles as well as artisans. We already have two nobles and two artisans for this scoring up here, and if we got another noble, that would count for this, but then of course we would need two offerings to make that happen. At the moment, we have one offering, which we would not get rid of, so if we got one more noble and one more offering, we would be able to score both of these. Of course, this just requires two artisans, and we currently have three, so if we were to keep playing, we would also be incentivized to try and work up the Nile in order to score that pillar as well. Now let's look at our cards as an example. This one is worth three points plus three for every noble card we have, so right now that would be worth 12 points. This one over here is worth four points plus four points for each of the column scorings that we do that are flanking this specific area, which is the noble area. That means this is worth a bonus four points if we complete this column, and another four points if we complete that one. So this is yet another reason to try and focus on completing these columns, because they give points, and we get even more points out of this noble. Lastly, some of the nobles don't actually give you any bonus points like this one here. 
The final example card I'd like to show you is this one, which is worth 8 points plus 2 extra points for every silver wild resource this player has at the end of the game. Obviously, at this point, they don't have any, so once the game gets closer to the end, they would probably try to start holding onto these more. After scoring noble cards, we will then all score for the points listed on the artisan cards that we have taken. Obviously, this one is worth 4. When we look at the 3 that we have, we have 12 points already, and the blue player currently just has 2 points in artisan cards. Moving on, it will then be time to score the Burial Chamber track. This is simple, you just get the points associated with the spot where your cube is. So if the game ended right now, green would get 16 points, and we would get nothing along with the blue player. After that, we can then score the Nile tracks. Each of these 5 tracks is worth 0, 3, or 7 points for the players, depending on where their tokens are. For example, the blue player currently has 3 plus 3, or 6 points, and the green player has just 3 points for this one over here. Once that is done, it will be time to score for our excess offering and resource tiles. We will simply get one point for every offering or resource tile that we have, plus any extra points that are listed on some of the offerings. So for example, the green player would currently get 2, 4, 6, 7, plus 2, or 9 points, and we would get 2, 4, 6, 8, plus 2, or 10 points for our resources and offering tiles. The final things that we score are the pharaoh tile, as well as the starting player tile. Now the pharaoh tile is worth 7 points to the player who took it, and again, you take it once you get to the third or more step on the burial track, and have at least two noble cards. Now the starting player token, when flipped over, shows 3 points, and these are the points that will be given to the player who passes first in the final round of the game. After scoring these, the final thing that we have to do is add up all of our points, and the player with the most victory points will be the winner. If there is a tie, then the player who has the pharaoh token will break the tie. If there is still a tie, then the player with the most resource and offering tiles will break it. And if there is still a tie at that point, then the tied players will share in the victory. Well, at this point, I've covered just about all of the rules to the game, which means this tutorial has come to a close. I hope that you've enjoyed learning how to play Pharon. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongusgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.